Oh, Clara, Clara, when you were a kid, didn't, didn't your parents warn you about playing doctor? Mine did. Hi, Mikola here. Cue the spoiler warning. Spoilers, spoilers, as if you don't know already. Yeah, you do know, don't you? You know by now. I mean, if you don't, you're probably just not that into Doctor Who. Took me long enough to get this review up. You should know by now. I'm sorry I made you wait. I went to a wedding last weekend, threw my whole schedule off, and I'm moving, threw my schedule off even further. Sorry, but thank you for waiting. Last chance, spoiler, Clara is dead. Glenn is alive. This was the episode that some were dreading, others looking forward to. The end of companion Clara Oswald. Well, we're way past the time you could just drop a companion off on the wrong street. This isn't Hillview Road. In the wrong town. I bet it isn't even South Croydon. And then go scurrying on off back to Gallifrey. Oh, there is a rumor about a return to Gallifrey. Well, this is the modern era. One companion was banished to a parallel universe. Another had her mind wiped. A third and fourth exiled into the past to live out their days. If Stephen Moffat didn't at least make a good faith effort to top the end of Rose and Donna and Rory and Amy, we'd be calling him a wuss or voice. Face the Raven, Episode 10, Series 9, written by Sarah Dollar, directed by Justin Malotnikoff. It's a weirdly unintended death. Nobody in the story wanted her to die, only the showrunners and the actor, who has found a starring role in another series. Congratulations, Jenna Coleman. Your Majesty. Oh man, what a mess this episode. It was the best of episodes. It was the worst of episodes. Mainly the worst. The first part of the episode was a Swiss cheese of flimsy contrivance that defies logic. The last ten minutes are superb, running the Doctor and Clara through a gamut of emotions, grief, sorrow, anger, tenderness, fear, resolve. If you want to appreciate the strengths of this series, and especially the two lead actors, just replay the last ten minutes of Face the Raven. If, however, you want a textbook example of flawed logic and preposterous plotting, replay the first 35. You can look at a story construction as a branch of engineering. There's a set of requirements to deliver, and then you go about assembling characters and arranging incidents to deliver on the requirements. If it's done well, if it's character-driven, the audience doesn't notice the seams and the joins. It feels like something that really happens. If it's done clumsily, it feels like you've been led around by the nose through an arbitrary maze and an obstacle course. Oh. Oh, my. The guest cast in this story features two strong characters that we've met before, Riggsy and the Shielder. But in this story, they're not strong characters. They're sticks. They're victims. The Shielder and Riggsy have been given nothing, nothing interesting to do in this whole episode. Both of them just standing there in the background, looking unhappy, helpless. The two biggest requirements for this episode's story come from the puppet master, I guess, even Moffat. One, Clara must die. Two, the doctor must be sent off somewhere by himself to face an unspecified ordeal orchestrated by an unidentified foe. But nobody wants the death of Clara, so writer Sarah Dollard has to contrive some acceptably plausible sequence of events to bump Clara off. Maybe have a building fall on her. No. Maybe have her hit by a car while she's talking on her mobile. Oh, no. Well, have her fall out of the TARDIS while acting like a ninny. No, no, nothing that quick, because there are a couple of additional requirements here. 1.1. The death must be inevitable, imminent, and permanent. 1.2. We all need to see it coming. 1.3. We need an interval after the moment when all the characters and the audience realize that Clara is doomed. 1.4. That interval must give the two lead actors an opportunity to do some meaty acting and also give Murray Gold a chance to earn his keep by reorchestrating Clara's theme for maximum poignance. And 1.5, the death cannot mess up Jenna Coleman's hair and makeup. Well, what could possibly get all that done? Ah, oh, she's under a death sentence from Moffat. Let's just take that literally. Make it a scheduled execution. That'll give her plenty of time to talk it out before the axe falls. Oh, but wait, the UK has abolished the death penalty. Oh, I know, a secret alien enclave tucked away inside the heart of London, where they still have the death penalty. And since it's aliens, it can be a really spooky method of execution. How about this? How about this? How about this? A spirit bird that flies into your belly and comes out your mouth in a black vapor. Go, go. That'll scare the kiddies. <laughs> but wait, wait, if there's a death sentence, there might be a reprieve, a last minute call from the governor, an appeal to higher courts, or a threat from the doctor. A threat from the doctor at his angriest, a threat from the doctor at his most intemperate, a threat from the doctor at his eyebrowiest.
You will save Clara, and you will do it now, or I will rain hail on you for the rest of time. Not a problem. We'll just add some blah 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 to cover why we can't set aside the verdict. Oh, but wait, wait. We can't, we can't just sentence Clara to death. She would have to be guilty of a capital crime. We can't do that to her, can we? Hmm. Okay, how about this? She does the Sydney Carton bit from Tale of Two Cities. Take on somebody else's death sentence. It is a far, far better thing I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest I go to than I have ever known. Will Clara do that? No. <laughs> I mean, she's not that noble. She's perky. She's impulsive. But okay, we'll do it this way. She doesn't actually think she's sacrificing herself. She thinks she has immunity. She thinks it's a sacrifice light with no actual risk of death. She thinks it's a strategy. Remember her conversation with Missy? Why does the doctor survive? Because he always assumes he's going to win. He always knows there's a way to survive. He just has to go find it. So all we need to do is come up with some blah, blah, blah that routes around her supposed immunity, forces both the doctor and Clara to accept her coming death, and... Whose death sentence could she take on? Well, it's got to be somebody the doctor cares about. Remember, we're also trying to trap the doctor. Okay, okay, so um, we need someone who knows how to get in touch with the doctor. Um, someone from Unit. No, too soon, too soon. Oh, how about that Riggsy fellow from Flatline last year, the graffiti artist? Now, here's where the logic gets really flimsy. Does Riggsy know how to get in touch with the doctor? Well, we'll say he does. We can retcon that, can't we? We'll say that Clara slipped him the phone number of the TARDIS. And, and who's going to pass a death sentence on Riggsy? Well, that's a shielder. We bring her back. We'll make her the mayor of Alien Alley. So our mysterious off-screen villain somehow bribes or threatens her to frame Riggsy for killing one of the aliens under her protection. Here's a cool visual. A shielder puts an animated tattoo on the back of Riggsy's neck that counts down. When Riggsy sees it, he freaks out and calls the TARDIS for the doctor to come investigate. Oh, wait, wait. How does the Shielder even know about Riggsy? How does she know that he knows how to get in touch with the Doctor? How does she figure he's even going to see a tattoo on the back of his neck? Who checks the back of their neck for random tattoos every morning? Okay, well, Riggsy calls the Doctor, and then what? The Doctor scans him, finds out he's about to die, has alien contact, and then... Then the Doctor immediately decides to go look for a secret hidden alien hideout in the middle of London. How does he make that jump? Aliens, I get, I get aliens. You, you don't get an animated tattoo at the local tattoo parlor. But an ancient hidden street for aliens smack dab in central London? How does he make that leap? He doesn't really know about this enclave. Riggsy provides no clues it exists. There's no deduction. Doesn't matter. It's an excuse for a flying TARDIS sequence. People love a good flying TARDIS sequence. Bonus, we can reinforce how reckless Clara is. Even Riggsy comments she enjoyed that way too much. The doctor says, yep, it's an ongoing problem. Foreshadowing. Okay, we get the doctor to Alien Alley. Now, how do we trap him to send him off to who knows where? How about this? It turns out that the person we think Riggsy killed is actually still alive, but she's just held in a contraption called a stasis pod. Well, it's a hybrid machine, if you will. A combo stasis pod and a teleport bracelet vending machine. How does he turn it off? How does he turn off the stasis pod to release the supposed victim and prove she's still alive? Well, first he needs a key. But not just any key. He needs the key to the TARDIS. You can only shut off the stasis pod with a TARDIS key. What? Help me, help me here, please. The aliens have built a lock that matches the TARDIS key? How? 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 And then they make sure the stasis pod is designed by the world's worst interface designer who hides the control panel at the far end of a long tube instead of putting it on the surface. So the doctor has to shove his arm all the way in. Ka-chunk! On snaps the teleport bracelet. And as we fade out, Clara is dead, the doctor teleported, and Riggsy tags the TARDIS with a Clara memorial. Roll the previews of next week's episode. Anybody expect the scene where the doctor hoses off all that memorial art? I mean, I can understand getting rid of this. But this? Are we going to be stuck with this until the end of time? Until next time, I'm Mikola. DVD extras. Still to come in the series, the hybrid. Oh, I'm not speculating. I can wait. Actors, well, method actors, talk about something called beats. Those are the atomic unit of drama, the moment-to-moment -moment chain of intentions, perceptions, reactions that make up the narrative. You see or hear something, you comprehend it, you react to it, you respond. Great actors make all of that very clear to the audience. And if you want to see beats in action, you can go to acting school on the way Peter Capaldi and Jenna Coleman spend their last 10 minutes together. Turn off the sound. Just watch the succession of emotions play through their eyes, their mouths, their faces. 
all the Kubler-Roth stages of death, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. It's all there, all clear. Well, does that redeem the episode for you? It's your call, I'm not saying. Clara calls Alien Alley a trap street, which I guess it is, but not in the way she meant. It's a street that traps the doctor. But Clara meant it in the sense that mapmakers use it, a trap for plagiarists. A made-up, non-existent street that you draw onto your own map, and then anyone who publishes a map with your made-up street must have copied your map instead of doing their own survey. You trap them. Like the paper towns of the John Green novel of the same name. But Alien Alley is the opposite of a trap street. It's not a phony street added to a map. It's a real street that was left off the maps. Nicola Irony Tracker notes that we first met Riggsy in an episode where Clara played at being the doctor and was praised for it. This season, playing doctor earns her reprimand after reprimand and finally a raven. Bubble links for you. I got a few for you. Uh, other reviews of this episode. Uh, the usual gang and my reviews of previous episodes. I I'm recording this on U.S. Thanksgiving and among the things I'm thankful for is you. Thank you for watching. Bye now.